how many attended the convention at Philadelphia at one time or another? Oh my God. 57? 45. <laughs> 73 at one time or another? 53. 56. <laughs> We did lose our state rights. <laughs> and there is a Not rat. because I disagree with Henry. I think he should have been at the table. I think Patrick Henry should have. And he was in the Virginia Convention, but he didn't go to the Philip. All right, so. We had one uh, delegate from New York that left for a while. Two left. Or two. Two left. And then they came back. No. Or one of them came back. No, they left. Hamilton came back. Yeah. But yeah. I'm going to save that for the fourth lesson. This is it. No, no, for the fifth lesson, when we talk about Madison and, and for two hours. I don't want to get that deep into that. All right, so you got 55. How many signed it? No, no, I don't, don't answer that. How many the last day? What, what, what day was the Constitution signed? What day was the Constitution signed? We brought it. Second. Yeah. Second. 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 All right, mm -hmm. September 17th. I don't mean it. But it didn't work on your website. No, no. 1787. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. All right, now I got a question. How many were there? September 17th. How many were in attendance? 31. <laughs> Either you know this or you don't. You know? This is well, important. the 55. No, it no. Was way less. No. Okay, it started with this amount of delegates. This is what mm -hmm. the only ones that attended. This is what was left. Right now, how many signed? 41. Who said that? Who said 41? You're absolutely wrong. <laughs> but you're close. Was it 36? 40. 39. Right. Yeah, 30. Okay, now, who didn't sign? One from Rhode Island. Rhode Island wasn't there. <clears throat> Rhode Island. Rhode Island, I don't, I don't even like Rhode Island. Rhode Island, I'm sorry. They, they, they uh, were recalcit so recalcitrant that the founding fathers at Washington, when he was president, he sent ambassadors to Rhode Island. And they treated them like a foreign country because they didn't come to the Constitutional Convention. That's, that's what they were doing. They called it Rogue Island. Rogue Island. All right. Who didn't sign? South Carolina or North Carolina? And then I want to know why. South Carolina. <laughs> and then I'm going to go into the under the news of the rest of the news. Thank you. Yeah, you go ahead. Get her up. <laughs> Who didn't sign? I wasn't there. I'm not doing this for my health. I'm doing it for my throat. I'm not 
try to be rude. Who didn't sign? Washington. South Carolina? No, Washington. Washington signed. But he wasn't a delegate. I mean, he was not, he was he was he was not a representative of the state. He was a delegate to the Constitution. He was a delegate, but he wasn't a state representative. Well, you're talking about someone else. Okay. Who didn't sign? South Carolina. You know, nobody knows who didn't sign? Why we're here. You're going to go out there and you're going to defend the Constitution? That's why I'm in the class. Touche. <laughs> okay. I had to uh, correct the history teacher today. I went to a history class today. And they said that Elbridge Jerry signed the Constitution. And I promised myself I wouldn't say a word, and I broke my promise. <laughs> oh, but Jerry did not sign the Constitution. Why not? Who is he? Yeah. You ever hear of gerrymandering? Yeah. Yeah. That's Elbridge Jerry from Massachusetts. He was a great man. He, was, he became vice president to one of the presidents. Madison. Madison is right. Thank you. That's what we want from that younger generation. That's what we want. Elbridge Jerry didn't sign. Why didn't he sign? He didn't sign because there's no Bill of Rights. And uh, Jefferson, Jefferson wrote to Madison from Paris and said, you've got to have a Bill of Rights. And Madison wrote back and said, no, we don't need it. You know why Madison said that? Now, Valley wrote a book on Madison, which is a good thing to do. Because Madison said, well, you've got all the rights that you need in, in the body of the Constitution. You don't need it. And some of them got upset. George Mason, great man. You need to know about George Mason. George Mason was from Virginia. He didn't sign the Constitution. He's the one who wrote, <clears throat> the Virginia Bill of Rights in July, just before the Constitutional Convention. And, um, excuse me, it was July of 1776, June of 1776, and Jefferson copied some of what Madison, or Mason had done. But he didn't sign because of the Bill of Rights, but he got up during the Constitutional Convention. You ever read Madison's notes? See, when all these people talk about the Constitution, NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox, talk about the Constitution, you need to read Madison's notes. Because Madison talks about Mason. You want to talk about guts and courage? You know, they were fighting over a penny over a stamp tax. We're 150 trillion in debt right now. They're talking about one penny. You know why he didn't sign? Because he got, he got, he didn't sign because of the, no Bill of Rights. <clears throat> he thought they should have Bill of Rights. He didn't like a few other things too. He got up in the midst of the fighting of the Constitutional Convention, which should never have lasted. It should have broke up. It should have been broken up. He got up in the middle of it and said, and he looked at South Carolina, and he pointed to Rutledge. And, and Pinckney and some of the other uh, delegates from South Carolina and said, if we don't abolish slavery, he's from Virginia now, if we don't abolish slavery at this convention, the God of heaven will rain down a curse upon this nation. He had 300 slaves. Mason had 300 slaves and he said that. That's guts. That's somebody that's committed to something. And there was one other person that didn't sign. <clears throat> and this person was the governor of Virginia, and he's the one who made the motion for the Virginia plan. Edmund Randolph, did you know it? Edmund Randolph. He was skittish about it. And when he got up and, and said to Mr. Chairman, he was talking to Washington, that I cannot in good conscience sign this. Well, I'll tell you, there was a hush in the room when he did that, because Edmund Randolph was well respected also. But he changed when he, you see, the Constitution is a skeleton. 
the meat and bones of the Constitution was put on where? It's a, the Constitution is a skeleton. You've got to know what it means. So you've got to put meat on it. And who put the meat on it? State Convention. State Convention. And so Randolph was at the Virginia State Convention, and guess what happened? He took a look around. He read the Constitution again. He looked at the um, situation of America, which was going into anarchy at that time. He said, you know what? I'm going to vote for it. And Patrick Henry called him every name in the book. It was a big fight. And they almost had a duel. They almost went out and had a duel. And uh, cooler heads prevailed. So these three great men didn't sign the Constitution. <clears throat> well, how did the founders get all the... Oh, by the way, there's about 250 founding fathers. <coughs> you got the Supreme Court. You got the first Congress. You got the Constitutional Convention, those that attended. You got the Declaration, those that helped write the Declaration of Independence, the Continental Congress. Uh, you got the first presidents that were there. You got many, many people that were involved in the creating of the country. <coughs> now, the big question is. Is it worth keeping the Constitution? How'd they put it together? Where'd they get these ideas from? All right, I'm gonna tell you where they got the ideas from. I wish my voice was stronger, but don't worry. It'll get stronger when I leave. I'll tell you where they got their ideas. <clears throat> Number one, let's see, let me erase this. And so we have a clean board here. And I'll write a little bit more. Who's he? Well, see, this is it. You don't know who he is. The founders knew who he was. And you know why they knew who he was? Because they had classical education. They had, <clears throat> that's right, they had classical education. Val was reading a book on James Madison. James Madison went to a country school, but he was learning this. He was reading this. Plutarch, Plutarch wrote uh, the lives of the noble Romans and the lives of the noble Greeks. That's Plutarch. And in this book is that man who we're going to talk about next. The first time we're talking about this man. In the history of man, <clears throat> there's two men that have written extensively and talked about separation of powers. Now, I want to tell you how this came about. Polybius lived from 204 to 122, you can either say BC or BCE, either before the common era or before Christ, however you want to say. <coughs> He's one of the greatest <coughs> of all Greek historians next to Herodotus and Thucydides. There were great debates about monarchy, aristocracy, and pure democracy. These were the debates that the, the Greeks were having. Polybius admired the Roman Republic, even though he was a Greek. He wrote 40 books of history. He didn't have a computer. 40 <laughs> books of history. His hand was tired. <coughs> Polybius looked at three forms of government and knew that each on their own would degenerate if not controlled with checks and balances. Okay? Monarchy would degenerate to tyranny. Aristocracy would sink into oligarchy. What's oligarchy? 
Just a few rulers. Many rules. No. Well, few rulers. It, it does, but something more. Even. That's true, but what? The money class. Well, <clears throat> the Senate was an aristocracy, but uh, aristocracy aristocracy sinks into oligarchy. Remember the Soviet Union? That was controlled by who? <coughs> who controlled them? The Soviet party, Union. The party. It, the Politburo. Yeah, the Politburo. Politburo. That's an oligarchy. Yeah. That's where a few control everything. A few control the whole works. And democracy, this Polybius, would lead into mob rule or mobocracy. Now, Woodrow Wilson <clears throat> said in 1960, I want to make America, we're not going to go to war. And then as soon as he got elected, we went to war. But he said, I want to make America safe for democracy. democracy. That was very harmful to this country that he said that. Because we are not a democracy. And democracy is in none of our founding documents. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. It's not in the Articles of Confederation. It is a republic, but it's a special kind of a republic because China's a republic. The Soviet Union was called the Soviet Republic. Republic. Yeah. What kind of republic are we? Democratic. 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 Constitutional. Rights in here somewhere, I hear that voice. A democratic republic. There's a little bit more. Representative. There's something before the democratic. Constitutional. That's it. We are a constitutional, democratic, we aren't now. We're not now. This is, this is what the Founding Fathers bequeathed or bestowed upon us. And in three generations, we've taken enough cyanide tablets to commit suicide. Constitutional, democratic, republic. We wrote everything down. Everybody sees what we did. Everybody saw what we did. Well, so how does Polybius fit in here? Polybius felt, <clears throat> this great Greek historian, that a monarchy had executive strength to lead administratively in a time of war. So you need an executive. You've got to have somebody who's an executive. Now the Founding Fathers talked about this at the Constitutional Convention. And they said, and there was a big debate about it. It took 60 ballots to figure this thing out. This wasn't compromise time. There was only three compromises there. This was consensus. We're going to talk it out, talk it out, until we finally get it. And they wanted, they were very afraid of an executive. How come? King George. King George. So they talked it through, and they said, you know what? Let's have like five or six people uh, as, as an executive branch. And James Wilson jumped up when that came up. He says, don't you remember the 76 tyrants of Greece? <laughs> oh, no, I forgot about that. Oh, you better not do that. Um, you, got, you need to have somebody that you can point to. That's where the decision comes. And that's what they wanted. And the only reason they did it is because why? They would have done the committee. They would have had three or four. You might have had them. Um, you could have had Hillary Clinton, uh, Scott Walker, and you, you know you could have had um, Joe Biden and the, all four of them. You know you could have had a whole bunch. How come they didn't do that? How come they went with one? They wanted a decision maker, but but they were very afraid of one. How come they finally went with it? Maybe it's easier to get rid of one. Well, it's <laughs> actually <laughs> that's true. That's true, but that's not what they want. I'll tell you why they went with it. Because they looked around the room and they saw a man that was six foot two and he had military uh, 
epaulets. You don't know, on a white horse. <laughs> he had a white horse. He parked it though outside. And they said, "That's the president. That's what we're gonna. That's what we're going to style that executive office. If Washington's not there, we can run the country." I, there is, you, you need, you just read it. There's no country without it. Period. That's, that's the way it was. Well, the democracy represented the past. Why is democracy a bad form of government? What's wrong with democracy? Pure democracy. Because you get the minority gets. Well, how would it work? How would, how would a pure democracy work out? It would be, it would be very unwieldy. The majority and everybody else has to it. Well, th this is right. Greece tried a pure democracy. Okay? Athens did. Athens did. So everybody had to vote for everything. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you keep up with every issue? Do you know everything about global warming? Do you know everything about the sewer plant over here? In in Medford. Do you, you know about what, what the Governor Kitsop is going through right now? Do you, do you know, yeah. Neither do you know about the, the uh, intrusion on our privacy at the federal level? There's too much. There's too much going on. You can't. So you gotta you gotta have people that you elect <coughs> that are honest. That's all you can look for. Because you're not in the private meetings with them. You're not behind closed doors, so you have to hope they meet the values that you want, but they've got to be honest. If they're not honest, it doesn't matter. Nothing, nothing, papers, constitution, declaration, none of it matters. You've got to be honest. You've got to have that character. All right, so Polybius goes on. After Polybius died, Rome became dictatorial with an emperor of governing, and we went back to ruler's law. Because I told you before, here's the continuum of history and government. Over here, you have 100% government. You got tyranny. You got Nazism. You got fascism, communism. They're all the same. You go to college, they say, well, communism's here, fascism's here. That's not right. It doesn't even make sense. Some university professors teaching this stuff to uh, young minds, it doesn't make any sense. This is 100% government. This is what? Yeah, right, that's right. So that's 0%, right? right. Mm -hmm. That's the French Revolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Robespierre, off with their head. I know what's best. I don't like people that know what's best. It's scary whether it's on the left or the right. Because if they know what's best and they take control, you may lose your head if you don't agree with me. Here's where the founders wanted to go. And I told you what it was. What's the name of this? The golden, yeah. golden. Utopia. Who said that? Golden. Golden what? Standard. Yeah. Me. That's right. Golden yeah. me. That's Aristotle's term. The founders read Aristotle. They, did not read. they didn't want to get involved with Plato. <clears throat> they read him and they thought he was a crackpot. So they didn't use anything he said. The founders got right here. Now, you can complain all you want. You can say, yeah, but they didn't do this for the Native Americans. They didn't do this for the African Americans. They didn't do this for women. What are you comparing it to? What what is it that you're you've got to compare something to something? You can't just come out and say they didn't do this. First of all, it wasn't going to happen like that. They wanted to abolish slavery. They couldn't get that done. Nine of the 12 states were for abolish. I just told you about George Mason. He had 300 slaves. They wanted to abolish slavery. They couldn't get it done. And the South knew it was wrong. But they said it was in their self-interest. So we got, we, so what are you going to do? Vote against the Constitution? Are you going to let South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia walk away? Because you've already got the small states you're upset. No, you're going to vote for the Constitution, aren't you? J J uh, James Madison voted for it. He didn't. He didn't. He had slaves too, but he wanted it abolished. But he voted for it because if you vote against it, you don't have a country, and then we don't know. 
I wouldn't be here probably. I'd be probably in Siberia. I don't know where you would be. We wouldn't be here because we wouldn't be the United States of America. So they voted for it. <clears throat> England was about over here. England was not a bad deal. All right, so now let me tell you the brains of Polybius. And you might say, well, what, what's he going over this doctor? Well, this doesn't make any sense. Oh, yes, it does. Because Polybius was the first one who said we need a Senate that will be the aristocracy. We need an assembly that will represent us democratically. <coughs> and we need an executive. There was no judiciary in Polybius. Um, <coughs> he was the first one that came up with that. And guess what? The founding fathers were him. And I asked you who he was tonight. You didn't know. Not one of you did, did you? No. So what if you have to go write a constitution? What are you going to do? What are you going to do if you got to write a constitution? What if, what if, you, what if all of a sudden the constitution gets, in, gets thrown out? What are you going to do? Read Polybius. You're going to do what? <laughs> You're going to read. <laughs> well, okay. So he came up with this during this period of time. And it only came up one more time. And I'm not going to tell you about it right this second, but we're going to go over it because we've got to talk about this man. This is Cicero. Guess what? The founding fathers used him extensively. They quoted him. And why? Were they, were they, these, these were well-read men and women. Women were well-read too. They, re they read, they knew, <clears throat> and they wanted to form something that was going to work. But it had to be based on natural law. Cicero played an active role in Roman politics and state. Cicero was assassinated in 43. He was a great man. He stood, he had guts, he stood for what he thought was right, and he got assassinated. Statesman and political philosopher. He wrote, and James Madison was a young boy, and he had to work. You young people, did you have you read Plutarch? No? Madison had to read this. The young man. Both the Greek and the Roman uh, thinkers. So in here is Cicero. So he was acquainted with Cicero. So were the other founding fathers. He wrote extensively about the importance of civic virtue. The common good and natural law. What in the world is natural law? Inherent rights. Human nature. Well, uh, human nature is part of it. Inherent rights from our creator. Now there was a Supreme Court justice that's sitting on the Supreme Court today. <clears throat> He's an African American. African American, second African American. To to the Supreme Court. He went before the Senate and he told them he believed in natural law and they vilified him for that. They absolutely excoriated him for it. Well, what is that? why did they do that? What's natural law? Well, natural law is the creator's order in the universe of things. Isn't that beautiful? You have, um, when we talk about Blackstone, a great English jurist, um, he built his law ideas based on natural law. And the founders used him. I'll tell you when we get to Blackstone, remind me to tell you about Abraham Lincoln with Blackstone. Cicero talked about natural law and he says, look, you have to chime in 
with what's happening in the universe. There's an order of things. You got the sun comes up and it comes down. You got the moon over here. You got certain things that are always are set up and someone set them up. And so um, he wrote two great books, one called The Republic and one called The War. And he envisioned a whole future society based on natural law. That was Cicero's dream. God gives man the ability to read. Where do you think you got your reasoning from? Now, there's some people that believe in God. Where, where, where do we get to John Locke? <clears throat> That's why I, we got to do this tonight, because you've got to hear about John Locke. Some people believe in God and some people don't. So John Locke would say, okay, if you believe in God, then natural law works through him. If you don't believe in him, then you have to use your reason. Because we all have reason. Now, reason didn't come from nowhere. Everybody's got reason. They, you reason things out. You think about them and say, okay, that, that makes sense. Well, the Founding Fathers were very into this. The reasoning of the mind <clears throat> is in its natural in its natural state will help determine right conduct with the Supreme Being. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not have a casino. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I thought it was in there. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> that was given to Moses by the finger of God. All of those Ten Commandments. And they're still, they're still in vogue today. But you can't display them. Well, that's, yeah. yeah. We, want, we don't want to do that. We don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> True law is right reason in agreement with nature. See, the world is set up, nature is set up, and the, these are all based upon a natural way of doing things. The Creator set all this up. He set up, why do you think we got silver and gold in the ground? Where did that come from? Where did the mountains come from? The volcanoes and the tremendous uh, uh, weather system that we have. Where did all this come from? <clears throat> you didn't have anything to do. You, you don't even, you didn't have anything to do with your body. You didn't even do that. I bet you don't even know who you are. <coughs> Think about it. You may find out someday. <coughs> your body's on loan. You had nothing to do with that. You didn't create your mind. Well, the founders were thinking like can't this. Can't find it either. <laughs> <laughs> you can't find it. <laughs> I don't believe you. I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, you'll be all right. Okay, now, I'm going to read something to you. See this? This is one of the original copies, because the copies they've done now have been covered to it. Let me read you something. This is a very good book. Here's what Cicero wrote. Okay. The animal which we call man, endowed with foresight and quick intelligence, complex, keen, possessing memory, full of reason and prudence, has been given a certain distinguished status by the Supreme God who created it. For he is the only one among so many different kinds and varieties of living beings. Uh, animals don't think like, they don't reason like we do. I mean, there's some animals that are, I have a dog at home, if I throw the ball, it gets the ball, but boy, it'll bite too. 
those louds bite. Yeah. For he, man, is the only one <clears throat> among so many different kinds and varieties of living beings who has a share in reason and thought. We are the masters of this planet. We can reason. While all the rest are deprived of it. But what is more divine? I will not say in man only, but in all heaven and earth, than reason. To be able to reason. And reason, what is it? When it is full grown and perfected, is rightly called wisdom. Therefore, since there is nothing better than reason, this is Cicero, and since it exists both in man and God, the first common possession of man and God is reason. How do you like the way Cicero was saying? Pretty good. Pretty good, wasn't it? Um, one other thing I want to read from Cicero. Because we got some others <clears throat> that the founding fathers were very interested in using. The most foolish notion of all is the belief that everything is just, which is found in the customs or the laws of nations. Now let me tell you something. Let me just stop for a minute. Blackstone, who we're going to talk about, said, you <coughs> pass a law that is not based on human, excuse me, on natural law. It is no law at all. There, there's laws that are written, they're bad laws. They're based on the whims of man. Whims and doctors, I'd say. What are the many deadly, the many pestilential statutes which nations put in force? <clears throat> These no more deserve to be called laws, then the rules, a band of robbers, which our politicians have become. Because when you marry power with money, it's a bad marriage. It always is bad. A band of robbers might pass in their assembly. For if ignorant and unskillful men have prescribed deadly poisons instead of healing drugs, these cannot possibly be called physicians' prescriptions. Neither in a nation <clears throat> can a statute of any sort be called the law, even though the nation, in spite of being a ruinous regulation, has accepted it. How do you like that? That's Cicero. Now, Bastiat, who wrote a little teeny book called The Law, talked about legal plunder in that little book. And I got reminded of it by uh, Wright. He said, are you going to talk about that? And I said, nah, I don't talk about it. But I think we should talk just a little bit. Legal plunder is when you're taking money, property, from constituents, let's say. You're doing it legally. But it's legal plunder. It's not right. Cicero do that. Something. I was thinking about roads and yeah. public education right. and things like that is for the common good for 
every child in America gets an education. Uh, everybody rides on the roads. Everybody crosses. But what if the what if the federal government builds? And I I was in uh, Fenway, Washington for 20 years, and there was a thing called the spur that went through Tacoma, Tacoma and it made it easier to go from Tacoma to Gig Harbor. There was a little town, Gig Harbor, on water. And it was federal money. It was a road. Is that the common good? If people go to work. Well, but in the founder's idea, what was the founder's idea of the common good? Well, but then you could say, even, then you could start saying, even people in Brooklyn can't go to Manhattan because that would be not the common good when they built the bridge. Well, who should build the, the bridge? Or the bridge or road? Well, from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Well, according to our the highway thing, we put in the money and it gets built for the common good. Well, you're talking about federal money, but yeah. who's really responsible for the, the road? The state. The state is responsible for it. About because the, the common good, if you, it's what? How about the rule of law is the most basic thing that is for the common good? That we all have a common understanding of how we make contractual relationships with each other. That, certainly nobody could contest that. Nobody would contest that. But my contesting is the common good means for the United States of America something that everybody can participate in. Otherwise, you can't do it. Right. Now, I know that sounds harsh, Beth, but the it's problem we've realistic. got... It's not that it's harsh. It's not, just not realistic in our society today. Well, that's why, we, that's why I believe, yeah, my belief is to go back. Because Bev's, Bev's got a big heart, and a lot of people believe the common good is for that. I think most people do. I don't think I think she's in the majority. I'm in the minority. I believe because I believe that the founders believe. And by the way, in the Constitution, there is nothing, no grant of authority for this. Uh, if you're really going to follow the Constitution, you, you said you like the Constitution. Uh, the common good is for the common good of everybody. Not for New York, not for Arkansas, not for Tennessee. We got the TVA authority. We got in the 30s. That's not the common good. It may have been an idea. It may have produced some power. Right? Could it be thought of as between the states? Uh, I like between the states. states, in other words, things that one state could not take care of, that it was because it was it involved more than one state. You mean two states could could do it? Is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is that um, the common good being between states rather than interstate. Well, the common good. Interstate. The common good has got to involve. Like transportation. Uh, transportation. Like, transportation is not a federal responsibility. I thought, I, I thought like, uh, commerce between the states was... Commerce between the states is something different. But well, I'm talking about, about interstate I'm talking about, now, you're going to disagree with me because you're going to say, yeah, but Eisenhower had the interstate the interstate highway system. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? You did yeah. say a long time ago in, in one of our classes that the Constitution was not a static uh, document, that it would be evolving, that that's what the Founding Fathers saw, it, because they didn't, in 1776, they didn't know what was going to happen in 1987 or whatever. So if that's an evolving uh, piece of work, yeah, so it, you know, the common good can change over, because the society itself changes, as well as other laws take on different meaning because the people in the country take on uh, a different role. Well, then the question is, is it evolving? How do you, how do you evolve the Constitution? <laughs> if you want, if you want to, let's say you want a, uh, a bridge from in Montana, from Dillon to Great Falls, let's say. You gotta have a bridge there, there's a, there's a river there, there isn't a okay. How would you do that, federally? There's a specified way to amend the Constitution. It's spelled out. How do you do it? 
Constitutional well, actually, there's two ways to amend it. There's actually two ways. Constitutional convention. Well, you can amend it. The state, we've got to do that now. We, we need to, to um, it's in the fifth article. Two thirds article of your yes. constitution. Yeah. 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 Three quarters of the states have to ratify. Three quarters of the states. Yeah. Two thirds of the Congress have to ratify. Yeah. Do you have your constitution with you? <clears throat> you do or you don't? You don't, why not? <laughs> You're gonna be lightning come through there. Alright, let me read this to you. This is Article 5. There was a wise old man in the Constitution Convention that looked ahead and said, I'm really worried that the American experiment may fall apart. So I'm going to put something else in there. And his name was? Benjamin Franklin. He was wise, but he didn't do this. It's the same man that didn't vote for the Constitution. Madison. Madison voted for the Constitution. Edwin Randolph. George Mason. George Mason. George Mason. He looked ahead and said, you know what? This, this may not work. <coughs> There's a possibility. So I'll tell you what he put in. Now here's Article 5. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses, shall deem it necessary shall propose amendments to this Constitution or, or, that's the big word, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states yeah. shall call a convention yes. only for proposing amendments though, not for changing the Constitution. They can only propose it to amend. Mason added that. Nations more like that. Well, so just to come back to what Ben said, because I, I want to close that with chapter. Um, I do not think, as I have studied this for four decades now, and the reason I did that on my own, I think you young people, the best way to learn is self-study. Self-study. That's the way you learn. I felt that. <clears throat> excuse me. Let me get here. I looked at the landscape when I was 25, and I said. The country is going to need people who understand what the country is. And in order to make changes, we have to understand what actually was done. This is a success formula. This is not a failure formula. You know Frederick Douglass? You know who Frederick Douglass was? Abolitionist. He's a black abolitionist. He's a good friend of Lincoln. He said, you know, um, the Constitution is an anti, is, excuse me, is a pro-slavery document. But then he got to reading it. He started reading it. And afterwards he said, you know, I was all wrong. It's an anti-slavery document. It's not a pro-slavery document. The founders had a way, they wanted it abolished. And, it, and for the first time in the history of man, white northerners helped to free slaves, black slaves, that could not do it themselves. Slaves couldn't free themselves. It took white northerners and some northerners to free them. And it took 600,000 lives to do it. First time in history anybody did that. And if you were at the Constitution Convention, you could not get rid of slavery. And then as the generations went along, it started to degrade itself. Well, <clears throat> the founders, the founding fathers of this country called 
for a virtuous society. Like Cicero one. See, they'd read Cicero. You read Cicero. You didn't know who Polybius was. You already messed that up. Well, they read Cicero, they read Polybius. And Benjamin Franklin said this. You know, he's a good, that's a great man. That's a great, there, there's, there's somebody you young people need to be like. Um, he got up, the Constitutional Convention was ready to disband. They were fighting about everything. They couldn't agree on anything. It, it, was, a, it was a mess. And uh, as a matter of fact, Gunning Benf Bedford from Delaware pointed a finger at Rufus King from Massachusetts and said, we're going to go on the side of Britain. We're not even going to do it. Oh, I tell you, there's always fisticuffs. Franklin got up. He Actually, Franklin couldn't really get up. He had uh, gallstones, right. big gallstones. And they had to bring him in <clears throat> on a French settee. Yeah. Yeah. They, they carried him in. And guess who carried him in? <laughs> who, who carried him? Slaves. Oh, you clown. <laughs> <laughs> Who carried him in? Prisoners. Who? Slaves. Prisoners. Prisoners! Prisoners, that's right. From Pennsylvania State Prison. Carry him in. They were doing something. They used him. Not like what we're doing today. They carried him in. Every movement Franklin made, it was pain, painful. He was born in 1706. So in 1787, he was 81 years old. Oh, it's just terribly painful. The old man just, he, he just stuck it out. Well, the, the convention was ready to uh, break up. He got up and said, sir, I have lived a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. Oh, I want to tell you, a hush went over that small little group of men. They said, yeah, here's a, here's a great man. The only reason we came over for him, the president, he's too old now. He was governor of Pennsylvania. They said, maybe, maybe we'll try it one more time. And they started to get some things done. They never did have prayer. They couldn't afford the minister. But he said this, Benjamin Franklin said this, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. Uh, then he said, as nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. You know why? Because self-government goes. Self-government starts to go. Well, listen to this. George Washington, the father of our country, who we don't listen to anymore. You know, they read, they read Washington's farewell address every year in Congress. There's nobody there. He gave his farewell address on my birthday. Another one, September 17, 1796. Very nice of him to do that. And one of the things he said in that farewell address is said, "Don't entangle yourself." Do you know if you if Russia with the madman Putin <clears throat> goes into the Baltics that we're involved because mm -hmm. we're in NATO? Yes. Yeah. Uh, think about it. Think about what we've done since World War II. Anyway, here's what Washington said. He praised the American Constitution <coughs> as the palladium of human rights, but also pointed out that it could serve, survive, excuse me, only so long as there shall remain any virtue in the body of the people. Now, I'm going to tell you, can somebody get me some more we're doing it. Hot cider. We're working on it. It, it took two hours to heat up. <laughs> <laughs> I want my pay raise.
Um, let me tell you something. The problem with this country is not the budget. The problem with this country is debauchery. If you lose the virtue of your country, nothing means anything. The documents, these are great documents. These are amazing documents. The Constitution, Declaration of Independence. How many times have you heard? Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That's a goal. That's a goal. That they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. And when we get to law, we'll talk about what inalienable means. Among those being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not property because, because you had slavery there and the southern states did one day. These are beautiful documents, but they don't mean a thing if your society gets corrupt. Because you're not going to follow them. Why would you? Okay, another great man, John Adams. And I want to tell you, John Adams was a cantankerous old guy who has to be in the Mount Rushmore of American history because without John Adams, we wouldn't be here. But he said this. He said, I know I'm going to be unpopular because I'm obnoxious and distrustful. But I'm going to do the right thing. And I'm going to agitate for independence. And I'll, I'll tell you, it got so bad in 1776. When John Adams would have sent the stairway to go to the Continental Congress, the other delegates would walk away. Because he was agitating. We've got to fight Britain. We've got to declare our independence. And guess what? John Adams won. The, did you see the 1776, the uh, play, or the, yeah, John Adams won the day. New York abstained, but all the other states voted. He said this, our Constitution, <coughs> by the way, the HBO special on Adams is very good, except for one thing. And what is that one thing? <coughs> Did you see it? Yes. They don't talk about his brother as much as they should. What's that? They don't talk about Sam Adams, his brother, as much as they should. <laughs> well, that, they have a little Sam Adams, but not much. No, there's something missing. Missing. <laughs> What's missing? John Adams was an extremely religious man. You don't see any of that. No. That was the basis of John Adams. Our Constitution was made, this is John Adams, only for our moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Here's Sam Adams that Wright was talking about. The sum of all, and Sam Adams is great, you don't hear much about him, he was the father of the revolution. <clears throat> the sum of all is, if we would most truly enjoy the gift of heaven, let us become a virtuous people. Then shall we both deserve and enjoy it. While on the other hand, if we are universally vicious and debauched, in our manners. Though the form of our Constitution carries the face of the most exalted freedom, we shall in reality be the most abject slaves. That's John Adams. <coughs> Thank you. Maybe pretty much. Sure. Well, here's my favorite, my favorite American of all time, who has been absolutely thrown under the bus. Uh, because if you get rid of this man, you get rid of America. His name is, he's a redhead, 
his freckles. Six, two and a half. Taller than Washington. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. Here's what he said. Virtue is not hereditary. <laughs> Think about that. There <clears> were <throat> many religious founders. <clears throat> Benjamin Rush. He signed the Declaration of Independence. He wrote a book about reading the Bible in the schools. James Wilson, signer of the Constitution, first Supreme Court Justice. I've talked about James Wilson to you. He wrote the first law book in America based on divine law of the Bible. Fisher Ames, you know who he was? Fisher Ames really is the father of the First Amendment. <clears throat> Congressman who primarily helped shape the First Amendment. He wanted the Bible taught in all schools. Elias Boudinot, you know who he was? That's a great man. Elias Boudinot was president of the Continental Congress. There was 14 presidents of the Continental Congress. Elias Boudinot was one of them. He signed the Treaty of Peace with Great Britain in 1783. He helped frame the Bill of Rights. He was the first president of the American Bible Society. <coughs> The first Bible printed in America <clears throat> was September 12, 1782 by a unanimous vote of Congress. How do you like that? That was the Continental Congress, 1782. What was that date again? 1782. September 12, five days before my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you forget it. Now I'm going to tell you that you need to teach religion in the schools. I'm going to tell you what religion is. I, I had religion taught in school when I was school. What, what did they take? What kind? We, 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 we were taught scripture. And uh, we taught the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the New Testament. And as far as I know, they, well, at least I know in private schools, other private schools, yeah. I know that they still teach. Okay. Um, I love the public schools. I, I don't know what they do now. Yeah. But they, but they did, uh, back when I was teaching, it was the separation. Well, England is our, is our parent. <laughs> Um, I'm going to tell you what religion you teach in the schools. What, what religion should you teach? God. Okay. That says not. If we have a separation of church and state and do not teach a specific religion, and you teach the Bible, which is, but that is separation of church and which is, which is not a particular religion. How about natural law? What about it? That would be a good one to teach. That should be taught. Right. Philosophy. Now, let me say one thing about, before I read what should be taught, let me say one thing about um, separation of church and state. Because this is very, that brings up a great point. That language is in the Constitution. The First Amendment says freedom of religion, no establishment of religion. Establishment is what? What's an establishment of religion? It's a church. 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 Right, okay. The church and state, where'd that come from? And what was he referring to in that letter? Who did he write it to, by the way? Danbury. Danbury Baptist. A lot of people know this. This is good. What was he, what did he mean by that phrase? Because that's not, that didn't originate with Jefferson, that church and state. That was before Jefferson. Well, what, did, what was he talking about? He was reassuring the organization that the government wouldn't meddle and control. What government? What government? The federal government. So the state that he was talking about was the federal government. Let me tell you a little secret. For the first hundred years in this country, 
they were holding church services in the capital. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Is that is that a separation of church and state? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then obviously it means something else. Um, the founders wanted religion and all kinds of. They wanted the states. Here, here was their ideal on this. Federal government, stay away from it. Didn't want one single religion ruling the people. They didn't want one single religion ruling the people. That happened with in the Dark Ages when the church was ruling Europe. That happened there, and it was in England too. Yes. Yeah. They had, you had the, uh, the Reformation in uh, in the 1500s where the Puritans were trying to break away from the Roman Catholic Church into the into the Protestant. Right. And then you had the sects that, that <coughs> broke off from uh, in, into different sects in the Protestant religion, and they became more dominant in the northern part of, uh, of Europe, uh, whereas uh, Catholicism uh, was more dominant in the southern part of Europe. And there were fights and wars. Yes. Um, still <clears throat> in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Let me say this about it. Let, let me tell you what the founders' idea was. Their idea was this. If you have to go to the restroom or anything, just go, because I'm not going to stop. <laughs> Their idea was this. And this is what the Bill of Rights. What is the Bill of Rights? The Bill of Rights is a check on what? Government. And the government. Power, what government? The federal power. It's a check on the federal government. That's what the Bill of Rights is. Yep. What's the Tenth Amendment? Any. Anything that right. isn't expressly given to the federal government goes to the state. State. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They, they were very <coughs> into state power. We completely obliterated that time. Yes. And it's a dangerous trend we're on. Right, now let me tell you what their idea was. And um, Lorraine was talking about natural law. They were very interested in this. Their idea was this, we want competition in the churches, in the states. As many churches as you can get, get them. You know why? Why? It keeps people at peace. It does what? It keeps people at peace. In peace. In peace. I want so to say competition are good in all realms. Yeah, yeah, th th exactly. Look, I want everybody to go to church. If you like Presbyterian, go there. If you like uh, LDS, go there. If you like the Greek Orthodox, go. Go to church. Worship. We need a virtuous society. But shop around. You might see something you like somewhere else. So you get a, a lot of different churches, just like Wright was saying. And then you may settle in somewhere. Oh, that's pretty good. I don't like what was said over here. I'm not sure about the Nicene Creed. I think that's, um, matter of fact, I've read that three times. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I gotta go somewhere where that's not there. You know, there's competition. And that's okay. That was their idea. Now, Patrick Henry said, the Bible <clears throat> is a book worth more than all the other books ever written. And I want to tell you something. Patrick Henry was one brilliant dude. He had like about 15 children. You know, King George had 15 children and went insane. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. So I had 15 children. <laughs> All right, now, they asked um, Benjamin Franco. He wrote a letter to Ezra Stiles, who's the president of the uh, what do you believe in? Anyway, we, know, we all know you're a great man, but we're not too sure what you believe in. He says, here's my belief. Good, I want to read this out of Okay. He says, here's my belief. I believe in one God, <coughs> the creator of the universe. That's number one. Number two, 
And this is what, what I'm going to read you now is what the founders wanted taught in the schools, and it was being taught. They didn't just want it, it was being taught. And I'm going to read you something in a minute. Northwest Ordinance it was written just before the Constitution was signed. I'll read it to you in a minute. So that was number one. <clears throat> number two, that he governs it by his providence. All, they felt that all young people going to school needed to know this. Number three, that was two, number three, that God ought to be worshipped. And number four, that the most acceptable service we render to God is in doing good to his other children. Mm -hmm. This is Benjamin Franklin talking, it, it, writing a letter to Ezra Stock. Doing good to other people. Good to his other children, his other, you know, your neighbors, your other people. Number five, that the soul of man is immortal. Now this is Franklin is writing this letter. He's considered one of the least religious founders. But he was religious. And this is his religion. Number six, and the soul of man, and this, this is what he's saying needs to be, this is what the founders were teaching in the schools. The soul of man will be treated with justice in another life, respecting its conduct in this. How do you like that? Good one. Now, would those six things um, provide a virtuous society? If you taught that in the school, you didn't mention any religion. There's no Presbyterianism. There's no method methods. Catholics, uh, Jews, not nothing. It's just a general thought. Then Franklin said, these I take to be the fundamental points in all sound religion. See, the founders didn't think atheism, atheism was sound. They thought atheism was irrational. They had read John Locke, who we got to get to. I can't wait to get to John Locke. They read him extensively. <clears throat> Sam Adams says, the religion of America <clears throat> is the religion of all mankind. John Adams, the general principles on which America had been founded was that the ones that practiced it. Thomas Jefferson, who had a way with words, said, these are the principles in which God has united us all. Now you think of the major religions today and what I just read. How many of them disagree with that? Now, you know about the Northwest Ordinance, don't you? The Northwest Ordinance was written in 1787. And it specified what those states to the West would be governed by. This is, I don't expect you to read stuff like this. You must have some crayons at home, don't you? You don't need to read this. Article 3 in the Northwest Ordinance. Listen to this. This is, this is uh, ratified in July of 1787. Constitution was ratified in September of 1787. Right? Listen to what they said should be done. And uh, Ben was talking about education. Religion, here's what should be taught. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. Schools 
and the means of education shall forever <coughs> be encouraged. The utmost good faith shall always be observed towards the Indians. And they went on with that. <coughs> Those are the three things that need to be taught in school. Religion, morality, and knowledge. They knew better than we know. We don't know beans today. I tell you, we don't know anything. We're just kind of trucking along here, having fun. Uh, you know, I wake up every morning now, and I feel fantastic. You know why? I say to myself, I'm not Pete Carroll. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was a petition or a treaty signed by Adams between the United States and France um, that stated something like that the United States was not in any way founded upon the principles of Christianity. And I was wondering what the context was for that. Who said that? Or um, I, I think it was a treaty that was signed by Adams between the United States and France. That what now? That, the, that was that the was United signed. States was not founded on what? The principles, or, or that was not, or I think it was the United States government, or the United States was not founded on the principles of Christianity. Well, the United States. Was <laughs> yeah. and, and I know the other statement that uh, that what, who was it? Jefferson said. Uh, Oh, no, no, that Adam said that the United States was founded on the principles of Christianity, and then I read this, and they seem to conflict. No, the, the, the United States was founded on Judeo-Christian <coughs> beliefs, because most of the people that, were, that populated the United States were from Britain. And isn't it true that, um, you know, even as they wrote those amendments to the Bill of Rights and the uh, religion, religious clause there, that every one of them had pledged allegiance to the Christian faith to be a representative of that state there in that house trying to make that amendment. It would make no sense if they were trying to deplete the Christian uh, faith from it. And I believe even as the colonies came in, and if I'm wrong, I, I believe the number either 11 or 12 of the states continued to make it mandatory that you pledge allegiance to the Christian religion. And again, not sects and denominations, but a principle of the creator of Jesus Christ, etc. Well, men like Washington never referred to, they never used the name of Christ. They, used, they, they would speak in a very hard way, they say divine providence did that. But we later found out, I've got a book at home that's about this thing, uh, about Washington and all of the religious things that he did do. A lot of people say Washington wasn't very religious, that's, that's pure bunk. It's just absolute punk. And this, this book, he, um, we'll get it, I'm going to break this to you. When we get to the, um, what is this, the third one? Next week, in Washington Creates America. When we get to that, I'll tell you about that. But let me go on now. Uh, Herman, I need number 26. Give me number 26, and then I'm going to tie something together. <coughs> I'm going to tie a mystery together. You're so lucky that I'm here. <laughs> <coughs> if I was here, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be lost. You're so lucky. I watched Animal Farm last night. Right, sent me out. It was fantastic. I love it. All right, now, <coughs> thanks, Herman. Look at that. Look at this. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. He's got a pretty long nose. Like Bob Wolf. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you a mystery. Who's the first guy I talked about tonight? Polybius. <laughs> 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 Polybius. Polybius. <laughs> and what did he do? He did what? I can't hear you. What you he read three. Yes, he was agreed. But what was his name? <coughs> claim to fame. Why did the founders use the Separation of power. Separation of power. All right. Now, that was during this period of time. It took 18.
1,800 years before this came up again. And this is the man that brought it up. This man took 20 years to write a book <coughs> called The Spirit of Laws. In 1748, that book was written. It's a huge tome. The guy was an unbelievable Frenchman. He was a philosopher. It was unbelievable. He took 20 years to write this thing, and he's writing the history of the world and everything else. But he took a look at Mobius. He says he's, he doesn't have it quite right. He says, what we need we've got to have a Senate and we need a House. You have to have an executive. You've got to have a judiciary, but a, we want a weak judiciary. That's the way it's got to be separated. And he wrote it, and the founders read this stuff. <coughs> you take um, no dose. Anybody take no-dos? No. Or Salmonex or something like that? Go to sleep at night, put it aside, and read this. <laughs> I don't get that. Founders read this stuff, and they said, my goodness, this is the way. This is the way to do it. Because they, the founders had read the Bible, too. I'm going to tell you about that, if I get to it. Um, they read the Bible extensively, and they picked out of the Bible separation of powers, like in Jeremiah 17, 9. I didn't bring my Bible with me tonight. I got too much here as it is. I didn't want to read it to you. I want you to go home and read it. Jeremiah 17, 9, that's separation of powers. That's the executive, legislative, and judicial. Read what Jeremiah says. Read those numbers here. Jeremiah 17, 9. And then you go to Isaiah 33, 22. That's also about three branches of government. Then you go to private property rights. Thou shalt not steal. Why not? Well, because you, you took somebody's private property rights. Government has come to show out. Well, why is it so important about private property rights? I'll tell you in just a minute. Now let's go to Monastery. Because of time constraints, I'm going to go a little faster. <clears throat> we looked at Montesquieu. His political theories had such an impact on the Founding Fathers that percentage-wise, they talked about him probably more than anybody. They used Montesquieu. Well, you might say to yourself, well, so what does all that mean? It means that they took the time to have natural law, separation of powers. We haven't talked about Adam Smith. We talked about him last week, but I want to talk about him a little bit more. They took all of this stuff that was gold, and they put all the nuggets together, and they put it into one brew, and came up with something nobody else has come up with since or before. And we're ready to throw the whole thing away. Because we know we don't know about Montesquieu. We don't know that Montesquieu studied for 20 years. And he figured out the best way to keep men um, at bay is separate the power. Don't give too much power to anybody. Get it all separated, right, Ben? Get it all separated. And what are we doing? We're collecting tremendous power in the executive branch. Now. Because there's one word left out there. What are you looking at? The best moral government and a separation of powers. Different powers are divided <clears throat> equally among separate branches. We don't have a moral government today. So they're, they're overextending their rule. The executive branch has taken over. Well, the legislative branch has no power now. And who should check that? Uh, who should check that? Huh? Who should check that? Who should check the executive branch? Uh, the judicial branch. No, no, no. no the legislature. Yeah. The legislature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they that control that. the purse. Well, there's another reason. But if you no. don't have moral people, you're just going to have uh, 
chaos well, you like have, we have now. You have to have a morality. But let me just say one thing about what you're saying. Because you missed the first lesson. So you missed that. <laughs> That's okay, you didn't know that. Um, the founders wanted to go back to the Magna Carta. Magna Carta is where those rights of those Englishmen, at, at that time it was English nobles, then it got expanded. And I told you the history of that. I told you in 1628, Cook, Cook, he pronounced his name Cook, Cook, was asked by um, Charles I, I guess it was, do I have a divine right of kings? No. I'll tell you, England, we owe a tremendous debt. Tremendous debt to the English, because they sent the tone laws. We need to go back to the Magna Carta where we get those, those great rights of English freedom. Well, each brain should have the ability to check the others. They're not checking anything now. Right, that's right. And uh, now I know what I want to say. In the Magna Carta, the, the big thing that the English were trying to teach us, Parliament is where the power is. Parliament, well, that's our Congress. See, and now we've got tremendous Leviathan power in the executive branch. And I want to tell you something. Have you read this lately? Read what it says about the executive branch. There's nothing in there. It's a big zip. Unlawful power. Well, yeah. Now you've got it. You've got administrative agencies and everything else. Unlawfully, the Congress is not checking anything. But there's not much in here on the executive. And there's less in the judiciary. I got to tell you something. Madison, in his notes, is about 660 pages. 19 of those 660 is about the judiciary. They didn't talk much about it because they didn't think much of it. It was supposed to be very weak. Well, didn't they initially only serve a few weeks a year? The found, the, the, the found was the yes, it was far yes. Yeah, wherever they can find a spot. Well, they didn't legislate a lot. <coughs> we have so many laws now, nobody knows what they are. And plus, they don't read them. But we don't know. It's all complicated. Well, so that's one excuse. <clears throat> now, let's go to Blackstone. Listen to this brew that the Founding Fathers figured out. <clears throat> Blackstone was an English jurist that lived from 1723 to 1780. Great writer of law. Educated at Oxford professor of law in Oxford, he was elected to Parliament. He said that law operates on natural laws of our maker. How do you like that? I haven't heard any lawyer say that lately. <laughs> I've heard a couple say, works on the natural laws of my bank account. Yes. He believed that any statute is null and void if it violates the laws of nature or nature's God. That's Blackstone. He wrote the commentaries of laws on England. Four volumes, 1765. The founders quoted many times and used as their premier legal work for America. Even more so than England did. Now let me tell you about this story. And then I'm going to go over to John Locke. to see what was in it. And he 
there were some blankets and some covers and some other things. And all of a sudden, he got to the bottom of the barrel, and here's Blackstone, his four volumes. <laughs> and Lincoln read every one of them. He read all of Blackstone. Went bankrupt about a year later. But he knew what Blackstone said. You think that helped us? You think that helped the nation? Lincoln saved the nation. You can, you can parse. You can parse Lincoln if you want. I don't choose to do that. Uh, now let me talk about John Locke. Who is he? Who's John Locke? Um, Herman, can you go to 23? And we want 23, 24, and 25, so let's go to 23 first. There's John Locke. Thank you. <clears throat> Another Englishman. Who's darn English? I think I'm going to take Winston Churchill's bust out of my office. John Locke was an English physician and philosopher. He combined his medical observations with his political experience to develop ideas about human nature and government. Like Algernon Sidney, you remember him? I talked about him. Bev and Deidre remember. Do you remember who Algernon Sidney was? Algernon Sidney got beheaded in 1683 for saying that if the government becomes corrupt, you overthrow it. The founder said the same thing 100 years later. But Locke, when Sidney was beheaded, Locke took off. <laughs> uh, he didn't want to be beheaded, and he went to Holland. Well, <clears throat> he combined his medical observations with political experiences to develop ideas about human nature and government. Now, let me tell you a couple things. Here's John Locke. When you read John Locke, you've got to do it slowly. You've got to think about what he said. The founders have forever. Has anybody read anything about John Locke? Er, hey, have you read John Locke? Okay. Um, let me tell you about this. John Locke said, by the way, I want to ask you a question. Have you talked to your brain this morning? Your brain. Have you talked to your brain this morning? Did you talk to it? Tom, did you talk to your brain? I think so. I can't remember. <laughs> well, John Locke said you need to talk to your brain. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to talk to my brain, he said, and I'm going to prove that there's a supreme being. I'm going to find out. And this is how he did it. He said a clock <clears throat> has wheels, cogs, sprockets, and springs. <coughs> Even with the forces of galaxies expanding, <coughs> stars exploding, volcanoes erupting, and the North Sea surging. He was big in the North Sea, he's Englishman. These occurrences cannot produce a clock. Okay? He said, now I'm going to go a step further. He said this, only an intelligent being can create a clock or time synergy. A rock can't do that. Can a rock create a clock? No. It's an inanimate object, you can't create a clock. It's got to be an intelligent being, right? All right, this is how Locke was thinking. Now, Locke then said, see that rock over there? That rock could not create me because there's no, doesn't have any intelligence. So I know I have intelligence. 
So something with intelligence created me. <laughs> That's the way Locke said. And he said, <clears throat> atheism is irrational because when you talk to your brain, it makes no sense. <coughs> And see, the founders didn't think atheism was a sound religion. That was unsound. Now, um, a rock is a non-cogitative uh, piece of uh, uh, element. Non-cogitative, it doesn't think. We are cogitative. We think. You see how that works? The rock can't create you. All of these other things that are surging can't create the clock. Well, Locke wrote treatises on government, <clears throat> just like this. And he's the one who said that you have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and property. Why do you have an What is an inalienable right? <coughs> It can't be taken away. You can't alienate it. And it's a God-given right. That's right. Now, nobody can take that away from you. Your, your body is on loan. It's yours. It's on loan. The land out there, before there was any settling in America, that land was created, okay? You may get property there. That property is on loan to you. But nobody can take that property that you have away from you. They might try, but it's an inalienable right. You need to rise up. That's what the inalienable rights are. They're, and I think Americans, we've forgotten some of our rights and we've kind of let it slip away. But this is what the full struggle has been since 1215. Man has been killing man. We've been, um, we've been going from tyranny to anarchy. And we've been trying to figure out how do you do this. The English, Rubel, was a, a scholar in, in English uh, history, led the way. The founders picked up on that and they picked up on all of these great things, like Adam Smith. Now let me tell you quickly, because I talked to you about him last week, and I want to show a little film in a minute. Adam Smith said in his Wealth of Nations that I showed you last week, <coughs> there's four definite responsibilities, legitimate responsibilities for government. What are they? <clears throat> what should government do? Four legitimate responsibilities. Well, they must protect you against illegal force, like the Mafia. you got to have government to do that. Fraud. It's representation of an item. you got to have a government, you got to have a judicial system, you got to have a public safety system in place. Monopoly. Why does government have to protect against monopoly? This is Adam Smith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they do what? The opposite of competition. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's right. If you if you allow monopoly, then you, you're squelching competition. And competition is what makes America what it is. Because I, I showed, showed a little picture before, but you've got various people competing for your business. And they're going to try to make the best product at the lowest price. If somebody monopolizes the, the market, it doesn't work right. And there's one other thing that the government should do. What is that? Should guard against debauchery. They're not doing that. And why should the government guard against debauchery? What's the reason? Because if your society yeah, protects the morals, protects the morals, if society becomes exploitative in the vices like drugs, prostitution, 
gambling, pornography, alcohol, those kind of things, then the whole system crumbles. And Smith said, it doesn't matter. You, have, you can't have that if you want your civilization to go. You want the market to go, because there's a great market in the vices. Make a lot of money on that. But that's not the free market anymore. You've got to, you can't have that. Well, I want to show something to you. It'll take two minutes. And then I want to, uh, I want to uh, read to you what Adams and Jefferson said about Plato. And I want to read you real quickly about Marx.
This is Jefferson writing back to Adams. And I'm going to read Adams' response to it. They talked about everything. It, it just unbelievable what they talked about. About philosophy, about farming, about the 1776 and what went on there. Just amazing. Well, now they're talking about Plato. Jefferson says, I amused myself with reading seriously Plato's book. I am wrong, however, in calling it amusement, for it was the heaviest task work I ever went through. I had occasionally before taken up some of his other works, but scarcely ever had patience to go through a whole dialogue. While reading through the whimsies, the puralities, the unintelligible jargon of his work, Anybody read any parts of Plato here? <coughs> it's like reading Das Kapital. Yeah. I laid it down often to ask myself how it could have been that the world should have so long consented to give reputation to such nonsense as this. <laughs> now Plato's ideas have filtered into religion, they filtered into government, they filtered into the culture, it don't get into the schools. All right. Then he said, education is chiefly in the hands of persons who, from their profession, have an interest in the reputation and dreams of Plato. They give the tone while at school, and few in their after years have occasion to revise their college opinions. But fashion and authority apart, and bring Plato the test of reason, take from him his sophistries, futilities, and incomprehensibilities. And what remains? In truth, he is one of the race of genuine sophists, who has escaped the oblivion of his brethren, first by the elegance of his diction, but chiefly by the adoption and incorporation of his whimsies into the body of artificial Christianity. And he says, his foggy mind is forever presenting the semblances of objects which half seen through a mist can be defined neither in form or dimension. Okay, so Adams. What year was that? That's back. That particular letter. <coughs> was in July 5th, 1814. Now listen to what Adam says. Adams had read Plato in the Greek and in the Latin. Adams was a, a genius, pure. Was this John Adams or Samuel Adams? John Adams. This is, these are letters between John Adams and Jefferson. And if you come to um, the seventh, the last lecture, the sixth one, I'll tell you the real story how they died. They died on the same day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, need to hear the whole, you need to hear the whole story. And they didn't like each other. Right? Uh, at, their death, at their deaths. They were frenemies. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they were frenemies. They were, frenemies. <laughs> yes. they, they were united in a common cause, but they had different points of view. Right. right. That's, a, that's, a, com that's a complicated discussion. Louder. I'll, I'll, I'll try to, <laughs> so you can hear. Here's what Adam says. I am very glad you have seriously read Plato. He's writing back to Jefferson. And still more rejoice to find that your reflections upon him so perfectly harmonize with mine. Some 30 years ago, I took upon me the severe task of going through all of his works. Oh, it is with the help of two Latin translations <laughs> and one English and one French translation and comparing some of the most remarkable passages with the Greek. Oh, See, Jefferson knew seven languages too. Adams and Jefferson did. Amazing. I labored through the tedious toil. Now listen. My disappointment was very great. My astonishment was greater 
My disgust was shocking. <laughs> Two things only did I learn from him. One, that Franklin's ideas of exempting husbandmen and mariners, etc., from the depredations of war were borrowed from Plato. And two, that sneezing is a cure for the hiccups. <laughs> <laughs> Accordingly, I have cured myself and all my friends of that provoking disorder for 30 years with a pinch of snuff. <laughs> God bless you all. The Founding Fathers did something that no one else has done. And you, we need to respect it and understand it.